Welcome and hello everyone. My name is Nidhi and I will be your host for today's webinar. Our webinars are designed to understand mobility and provide you with insights into mobility across verticals. Till date, CTOs, CIOs, CMOs of Fortune 500 organizations have utilized our niche expertise to induce mobility initiatives in their organizations. Why Endeavor? Because we are the mobility company, having a decade of domain expertise. We are leaders in providing mobility solutions to over 300 customers, including many Fortune 100 organizations across the globe. Today, we will have a 45-minute session followed by a 15-minute question and answer session. Please feel free to raise any questions in between the session by typing it down in the Q&A panel at the chat window in your GoToWebinar console. At the end of the presentation, our panelists will take as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. This webinar is being recorded and will also be available within 24 hours at secondever.com backslash events underscore and underscore webinar. Our topic for today's webinar is Insider's Insight into Near Field Communication, also popularly known as NFC, presented by Tom Parrish, who is a mobile strategy thought leader. We also have an esteemed guest speaker from Research in Motion, Sadeep Rao who is Alliance's Solution Manager at RIM, and he would be sharing his thoughts on NFC-enabled BlackBerry devices. Our other panelists include Dwarak, who heads the Technical Competency Group at Endeavor, and Basav, who is the Technical Architect at Endeavor and part of the TCG team. Now, I would like to hand over the session to Tom. Thank you, Nidhi. All right, let's begin. I want to thank everyone for dedicating some time this morning to listen to this webinar. As I know, you're really busy this time of year. I think we all are. Personally speaking, I'm fascinated about this topic and hope you feel the same way. If you're here to learn to get an overview of near-field computing and the, potential, and the potential business opportunities, then you're in the right place. This will be a strategic overview. My guess is this webinar is going to probably have more questions for you than maybe answers, and that's because it's a somewhat complicated topic, and the whole area is right at the tipping point of changing and becoming more popular, more pervasive, as phones in the next year to become more capable of using near-field communication hardware and apps. So if you have questions, and I know you will, please Add them into the chat window box there. You should see it to the right of your screen. And we'll be capturing those during the webinar. And we'll be dedicating time at the end of the webinar to answer those. And like I said, I'm sure there will be a number of them. So just quickly, we're going to have an introduction to just exactly what is near-field communication. The next thing is the ecosystem. And this might be rather new to you. There's a lot of partners or stakeholders that have to participate, especially in a mobile payments type application for near field communication to actually work the way you want it to work in smartphone devices. We have a number of use cases, and these are sort of speculative in nature, but some of them make a lot of sense, and we'll be talking about a range of those. Since Endeavor has spent a great deal of time producing mobile apps, including mobile payment apps, they've come up with a set of guidelines and considerations that I think you'll find useful to employ as your outline in putting your strategies together. And we'll be talking more about the future of NFC. And as Nidhi said, we have Parip Rao, who is from RIM, and he's going to talk a little bit about what RIM is actually doing right now. Okay. So, I want to set a context so that you understand some of the technical aspects of near-field computing, given it's new and, and the business opportunities. Here's my question. Think about all the little things you carry in your wallet, credit cards, health cards, loyalty cards. Now, let me ask you, do you think your mobile phone will become your virtual wallet? All right. Think about that for a little bit as we go through the seminar. I have a short story for you that will help explain the big picture if this is completely new to you. Let's take my friend in a future scenario. My friend's name is Mike, and he gets on a train to go to his office. He sees a poster on the way announcing a free concert this evening, and he touches his near-field phone to a near-field mark. Actually, there's a little tag under there on the poster, and it instantly transfers the detailed information on this free concert. 
and he reserves a seat on his mobile phone using a text message to confirm it and then get a message to his wife to let her know about the concert and dinner he's going to take her to. Great surprise. When he arrives at the office, he touches his near-field computing phone to the office gate. Wham, it opens up. No fumbling for lost badges. At lunchtime, he pays for his meal using one of his credit cards stored in his phone using near-field computing tap-and-go, if you want to say that, at a point-of-sale register in the cafeteria. And no fumbling in the wallet, running out of cash. After lunch, he visits the office of his new business partners for a meeting. And those meetings... And those who are attending the meeting exchange their business cards, you guessed it, tapping their phones together, doing near-field communication. He meets his wife at 6, and he meets his wife at 6, and they go to the concert. He touches the phone to a turnstile, and they get in, no problem, confirmation of the reservation made. Afterwards, they do a little shopping, go to dinner. When they arrive home, he realizes he's left his mobile phone with near-field computing capability. He immediately calls the mobile network operator and requests the phone to be disabled. If you find the phone later, you'll able to reactivate the service. So that gives you a rather simplified view of what things might look like. Now let's go into a little bit more detail. So going from left to right, if you think of um, near-field computing as kind of having two components, you have the cell phone or some kind of smart device, and then you have TAG, which has near-field computing component in it. Um, Near-field computing allows a simple data exchange between two devices just by physical touch. You need both an initiator and a target, and the initiator, in this case it would be the phone, generates a radio frequency. Um, It's around uh, 13.56 megahertz. The key thing here is the range is four centimeters, or roughly an inch and a half. The target picks up the RF field and receives the data. What you might want to make note of is near-field computing is based on wireless standards-based type communication technology. If you're familiar with RFID technology, then you're going to see a lot of similarities here. Uh, The data exchange rate is 424 kilobits per second. And, you know, what really distinguishes near-field computing is a rather intuitive way in which you can just um, tap and go Um, exchange information in a proprietary wireless network in a secure way, in a very seamless way. So um, let's go on. We'll be talking more about how this is going to work. So let's think of three modes of operation, three different ways in which can be programmed into an NFC application, a reader mode, a card emulation mode, and a peer-to-peer. And briefly, in reader mode, you access information on on the move, like content distribution, information access. Think of it as smart advertising. We mentioned that, the poster, tap and go, get the information on the event. So that's when you're just using it as a, as a reader. Um, you could have sort of a card emulation mode. This is secure mode. The second one there, this allows contactless transaction like mobile payments, which we'll be talking more about, ticketing, access control, transit, you know, refilling a card, a cash card of some kind, or subway pass, or phone card, toll gates. And um, the uh, the other thing is that near-field computing device could also act as a tag itself, appearing to an external reader. Um, So it's, you know, very similar to traditional contactless smart cards. Final one, peer-to-peer. This is where, you know, you would exchange some information maybe with someone else. One of the more interesting um, opportunities in uh, peer-to-peer mode is that you could share Bluetooth or Wi-Fi link, and the setup of that could actually occur a lot more quickly than we're used to with, you know, that wait, wait, wait in order for the Bluetooth to to hook up and work. All right. Undoubtedly, you're familiar with other wireless communication technologies, RFID, infrared, and Bluetooth. What we want to show here is a brief comparison of the two. And um, the setup time is very, very short, tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds, kind of like RFID, but faster than all the other modes. The range, as I said, one and a half inches. That's not much, 10 centimeters. What's probably most, um, how I should say, most differentiable about near-field computing is it's very human-centric. It's sort of a you hold and touch and go, very people-centric. 
And the selectivity is really what makes a big difference is that you have control over who and how and with whom you want to communicate. So um, we'll be talking more about use cases and customer experience. Um, and as I said, one of the interesting possibilities is combining near field communication and Bluetooth where um, near field communication is used as a pair of the, part of the pairing or authenticating process for Bluetooth sessions to occur where you can then transfer data. So in short, at the top level, here are some summary items for the benefits of near field computing. It's, um, it requires no more than a simple touch to work. It's very secure, security ready with a number of built-in security capabilities. We're actually gonna talk more about that. In fact, seven different aspects of that. Um, uh, it's very versatile, ideally suited for a broad range of industries as you, as will come to mind when you're listening to some of these use cases. Uh, it enables um, sort of a technology enabling cap uh, tool in that since you can touch quickly and transfer information, you can more quickly set up another device that usually takes a lot of time to set up. Um, it's very interoperable uh, with existing contactless card technologies. That's a real plus. People have given that a lot of thought. More about that at NFC Forum. Uh, it's inherently secure due to the short range of it, and it's based on open standards. Okay, so here's a topic area in this seminar that will probably be new to most folks. It certainly was to me a while back as I was getting more into this myself, and it makes a lot of sense once you start thinking about it. And that's that for near-field computing ecosystem to work, there's a lot of players involved, and we're going to talk about it briefly here, and then we're going to go at it in more detail a little later on. On the bottom... Um, are some of the sort of hardware, uh, if my mouse works here, down at the bottom, you can see some of the hardware-specific stakeholders that are uh, participating in this currently, um, and everybody's got users. And then and we'll, um, there are these other entities that um, you're going to want to become familiar with called service provisioning and trusted service manager, as well as, well, we know our mobile network provisioning people. These are AT&Ts and Verizons and Sprint, at least in the United States. And um, service, service provisioning is something, um, or, or really a trusted service manager that acts as a neutral broker that sets up business agreements and acts as a bridge between financial institutions. This is all part of the ecosystem and all necessary in order for you to be able to set up mobile payments. The point of the slide is that we're going if, um, from here to here and you can see this sort of big gray earth here moving out. There's an expansion occurring in the contactless business domain, kind of a big word for what we're talking about, but there's a, an expansion in business opportunities because the chip manufacturers know what they want to do. The component tag manufacturers have that. They're, they're moving their hardware into, into a handsets. Um, users are starting to become more familiar with this whole notion of sort of contactless type applications. Service provisioning companies are coming into play in order to enable mobile phone provisioning companies, you know, the AT&Ts and things like that, with trusted service managers. All this is moving out, and all this is happening now in a very quick trend that's almost becoming exponential come next year. So more about the ecosystem and the stakeholders in the following slides. Let's talk more about the devices since we've gone kind of from the chip to the handset manufacturer, let's talk more about smartphone devices. Um, you can see on the left that there's a graph, and, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a tipping point or almost an exponential curve predicted of near-field capability phones starting next year, the jump, and then the following three years. For those following the market already, you're well aware that Android's... Um, various versions of the OS, Gingerbread and Ice Cream Sandwich already support NFC. Samsung leads the pack. Uh, BlackBerry Tag will become um, part of their BlackBerry 7 update, and, and we're going to actually go over that here soon uh, with our guest. And the other manufacturers, well, if you're like me and you follow at least, excuse me, some of the trends, 
You know, Apple is rumored to have NFC and phone iPhone 5. But of course, we'll have to wait and see who really knows what Apple's going to do in 2012. So briefly, before um, handing this over to Raul, we're going to, I want you to know that BlackBerry has you know, a couple of devices already enabled for NFC. And they have this thing called the BlackBerry Tag Service, uh, which is going to be a part of uh, BlackBerry 7 update. It's basically a software tagging that occurs in there that you have a common set of tags for the developers to use and a sort of tag API. Um, this will allow some basic user sharing of photos and documents and URLs, which would be pretty convenient. But they've also um, been approved uh, by MasterCard to two BlackBerry models, the Bold 9900 and the 9360 uh, for its pay pass program, which is really pretty cool. So now I'm going to switch over for two or three minutes to Rao and have him talk about um, BlackBerry in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to bring up his slides here. Thank you, Tom. Near field communication technology is now moving rapidly towards widespread adoption. Major handset manufacturers and operating system suppliers, including Research in Motion, are committed to delivering mobile devices with the built-in ability to deliver NFC functionality. NFC embedded smartphones CAGR prediction for 2010-2015 is 200%. RIM has recently launched a range of NFC devices in the market. The BlackBerry Bold 9900 and Curve 9360 smartphones have already received certification for NFC payments and are compatible with the UICC SWP protocol, providing a secure platform for NFC use. Phones using NFC as a payment technology are neither new nor solely a product of the U.S. market. NFC trials in Europe and Asia-Pacific have netted very positive consumer response. Brings to the equation a large addressable market willing to deploy embedded NFT in a standardized format. Telefonica Digital and Research in Motion recently announced a pilot program of the Telefonica wallet for the BlackBerry smartphone. In collaboration with local banks and retailers, Telefonica will roll out Telefonica wallet for BlackBerry to 350 employees at its headquarters in Distrito, Telefonica, Spain. Those taking part in the trial will be able to make payments in a simple, easy, safe, and convenient way by simply tapping their NFC-enabled BlackBerry smartphone against the reader. Employees that are part of the NFC pilot project will also be able to use their BlackBerry smartphone to gain physical access to the Telefonica headquarters office. Additional partners participating in the pilot include banking and financial institutions, retail and food stores, gas stations, and others. To succeed, NFC functionality needs to be put into the hands of sufficient consumers to attract service providers to the technology. And to attract the critical mass of consumers, sufficient services need to be available to provide consumers with the reason to equip themselves to use them. While much of the current interest in NFT surrounds its potential as a payment technology, ultimately its core potential is to access a wide range of applications from payments to discount coupons, NFT tags, smart posters, access control to transport ticketing and beyond. Ultimately, services will evolve that are designed specifically to take advantage of the full range of capabilities of an NFC device rather than being built to simply replace services designed to run on today's technology. Indeed, it may be that the development of these services is an essential requirement for creating demand for NFC technology. Over to Tom. Wow, thank you very, very much for that. It was quite interesting. And now we're going to move on to use cases. This is where things get a little more interesting from an application perspective. Let's just touch on these from left to right. 
if I may, please. You know, if you think about using this kind of technology in an uh, airport or train station, you could have an NFC-enabled phone for getting through gate passes. And as we said, talking about information that you could pull from posters, um, information you could get from kiosks. kiosks. And one of the things, uh, you know, I, I think really makes a lot of sense is, you know, you have to travel. Usually you carry some cash with you. But then when you get somewhere, then you've got to get a bus and then a cab and things of this nature. And sometimes if you try to use your credit card, you've got to wait five or ten minutes for every time you make each one of those things, you know, for it to be authorized and passed through. And when you're in a hurry, you're in a hurry. So having an NFC-enabled phone to allow you to sort of move through in record time um, without having to, to do um, that whole waiting process. But more importantly, now you've got a record automatically capped of when you made that transaction, where it was made, who you made it with. Boy, that makes reporting a lot easier. So vehicles, some really cool ideas around personalizing seat position. Use, um, you, know, you may use it to represent driver license, and that may take a while to come about, but that certainly would be convenient. Um, I like the idea of using it for paying parking fees a lot. And we talked about office-related uh, uh, uses of it already in our example. We're going to be talking more about pay with credit card. And one thing that will, um, since store and restaurants, it's, it's, I'd say um, the experts are sort of predicting that getting loyalty card points automatically at the point of sale and then using those coupons automatically at the point of sale during the transaction could be pretty cool for people like you and me that are shopping. That, that's the big hassle of keeping up with the cards and getting them and then actually cashing them in and using them. Um, I think that should be that should be a very uh, uh, big area coming next year. Um, theater passes, we talked about that, and then of course, um, you know, just being able to have a tracking history of everything that you've done and when you've done it without having to write it all down in general is pretty pretty attractive. Let's take three business opportunities, okay? Uh, mobile payments, healthcare. And retail, where we'll talk about a smart shopping card. Now, what would it take for things to really work in the mobile payment area? We all make mobile payments already to some degree. There's a huge number, huge shifts that's taking place. I think PayPal mentioned in Black Friday that they had 515% or something increase in mobile payments. But that's usually through their app, through uh, a set of stakeholders they've already put in place. And many of the mobile payments we make are with our banks uh, through a, 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 you know, a small web browser on our phone. So that's, that's, that's a different kind of thing. Um, let's talk about what is a mobile payment because often there's a little confusion between mobile payment and mobile banking. Mobile payment, the longer explanation, you have a short one up there, is it's defined as a transfer of funds in return for goods and services, okay, where the mobile phone is involved in both the initiation and the confirmation of the payment, okay, and the location of the payer and supporting infrastructure is not important. You may not be mobile, or you may or may not be on the move or at a point of sale, but the payment may be processed by credit cards or by a prepaid wallet. All right. So for that to work, really, it's not just about you and the person that you're making the payment with. Um, there are a number of other stakeholders that are keenly interested. And I'm going to move my, my thing down here, if I may. You have customer expectations, merchants, banks, telecom providers, mobile device manufacturers, and the government all have different motivations that have to come to the table and make it an agreement about how these payments are going to be done securely, who's going to be overseeing it from a trusted uh, service perspective. And um, so briefly, from a consumer point of view, and th this is all really important if you think about it, um, it's not just the high-level stuff. It's the stuff that when you're putting a strategy together for your mobile app and you're talking to someone like Tech Endeavor and you're getting your strategy together, you've got to consider all these parties in – the sort of use flow of the app in order for it to work properly. Consumer applications, let's face it, we want it to be personalized, but we want it to be easy, and it has to be private, and we need to trust it. 
We also, like money, want to be able to use it everywhere. Not just at this store and that store, but everywhere. We want it to, don't want it to cost us anything, and we want it to work with existing systems. So that's all we need is yet another app to load on the phone because this one doesn't work with that one. And it'd really be nice if you could use it for peer-to-peer transfers. The merchants, what's a merchant want? They want faster transaction time. So you're sitting down with them at the table, and you know they, they want it done faster. They can move more people through their, through their business. They don't want to add any more cost. Uh, they want it to integrate to the existing payment system. That has to be secure because so, they're liable for part of this transfer. They're, they want to be able to customize it to fit their service, right? And they want real-time status of the mobile payment service. That gives them an idea what to keep in stock. Banks, bottom line, what's a bank want? More volume, more card payments, less tra- less cash transactions. That's their big deal. Um, they are also looking for customer loyalty, but that's what they're looking for is more volume. Telecom, they're looking for new income by increasing the traffic. Their goal is to increase the average revenue per user and reduce the churn. In other words, keep people in the in the family, increase loyalty. So the more attractive they can be, the better. Mobile device manufacturers, again, they're looking for greater market adoption with embedded mobile payment applications and the technology to do that. So that also increases the average revenue per user per device. The government has taxation, of course, very hot topic these days, which we'll not get into. Okay, so let's take a specific example. How about the mobile wallet? Everybody heard of that? I'm sure you have. Uh, some interesting news about it. It's a free Android app. It turns your mobile phone into a virtual wallet. That's the promise. Um, uh, the um, Citibank um, MasterCard PayPass uh, is you know, teamed up with Google, and they're planning some offers to make all this work. Google Wallet will be compatible uh, with the Nexus 4G and available on Sprint. Over time, we planned, uh, they plan to expand the support to more and more phones, of course. Uh, currently, MasterCard, as I said, um, is, uh, has this PayPass. You've probably seen this in various merchants. 140,000 merchants are using this PayPass capability. Um, as I said in the, in the opening comments, uh, this was kind of a, taken from the whole Google concepts. They believe your phone will be a Google wallet and it will be the one thing that holds everything you need to carry except maybe those little pieces of paper. Yeah. Loyalty cards, gift cards, receipts, boarding passes, tickets. And um, you know how thick your wallet gets by the time you come home from a long trip from carrying all those receipts, right? And, of course, they're a big big um, pr- promoter of tap-and-go ca- capability or contactless payment technology to securely transfer information. Um, but, um, you know... <laughs> Uh, there was just a news item that came out. Uh, I think last night I saw that uh, Verizon was planning on working with Google Wallet. And again, now Verizon's one of these stakeholders we mentioned earlier in the webinar, and they're they're saying no. Now they're not going to do that. I don't have the details, but the point of this is that that you have to keep a lot of parties, a lot of stakeholders happy when you start bringing something this widespread that you want it to be this ubiquitous. That is for mobile payments. Keep in mind, near-field computing can be used for a lot of other things. For example, it might make sense to consider near-field computing um, type capabilities built in there as a, as a kind of virtual health card to store, you know, information about you and your blood group and age, health cards, and uh, I mean your insurance coverage, things of that nature. That might just speed up and reduce speed up payments, and reduce the amount of stress during emergency rooms, especially for medical reimbursements. We all know what a pain that can be, right? Um, Not to mention, every time you go into a doctor's office, especially if it's a a new doctor's office, there's more paperwork to fill out, and you're just filling out the same thing over and over and over again. So there's some opportunity here in healthcare with regards to payment, information gathering. Um, Of course, a hospital might end up using this kind of capability to ensure secure access to various rooms. Asset management, that's not unique to healthcare. I could see in my mind where near-field computing might be a perfect uh, technology for expanding use of asset management. I know, you know, of course, RFID tags are used in this area already, but there's more capability with near-field computing. And, um, of course, the other thing would be reporting. 
could be speeded, could be sped up using near field computing as nurses visit from one um, person to the next. All right, let's talk about near field computing in retail. Now, if you've been into an Apple store recently or read about Apple, you've probably heard they're moving to this concept anyway. They're not using this technology yet. And it's kind of a self checkout. Um, so imagine no checkout line, okay? You go into a store, um, you find products that you like. Uh, let's say you go into Fry's Electronics, I'm a guy, and I've got four or five things I need. I put it in the cart. Every time I put it in the cart, I touch it with my phone, and that um, tag that's on the product transfers the information about the product, what sort of discount I might have if I'm a loyalty uh, card carrier, um, reads the product information and the warranty that's with it. And then by the time I get to the sort of security gate thing, it's already sent the payment, um, created a receipt, and um, uh, obviously summed up all the pricing that needs to be there. And as I go through, once that's complete, the tag is killed. Now, that's a great convenience for you, but the, the, um, from a retailer's point of view, there's an interesting opportunity. Instead of having teams of people at cash registers, you can have those people be focusing on service and answering questions about products in the store. So it should be an interesting uh, shift uh, possible here in the retail environment. As I said, Apple is starting to experiment with that, that already. All right. Now let's talk about guidelines and considerations. I mentioned this to you earlier. Endeavor has um, one of their strengths is putting together mobile strategies. And they have done mobile strategies for years and they have adjusted those mobile strategies to fit changes in technology that have occurred over the last seven or eight years. So here is here are one, two, three, four, five, six, six topics that you'll want to be keeping in mind as you're writing your strategy and putting together your thoughts with regards to how to pull together an application or a set of applications using near field computing capability. Generally, people are wanting fans faster transaction times, whether whether it's money or transfer of data or whatnot. Is that if that's true, then you have a, you may have an opportunity here. If you don't care if it takes a day for someone to transfer the information, it's not a candidate. How important is interoperability between devices and tags and standards? Um, if that's true, then the NFC would be a good a, a good opportunity to consider. Um, do you need to integrate with existing payment systems? Probably so, but not always. Okay. Um, how important is it to follow regulations? For mobile payments, well, obviously for mobile payments, in most cases it is extremely important for consistency, privacy, and trust, security. Um, with regards to security, which we're about to go into, um, um, how should you address that? And, of course, do you need to switch between reader and writer in your application? You know, what, what, what mode is the NFC app going to work? And then we should have probably had that security and privacy one as the sixth one, the last one, because that's the next slide. And that's the one probably everyone has already written a question about. And we'll remind you, send your questions now to um, to us there in the bottom right-hand corner, because I, I know full well in 45 minutes, there's no way we can cover all there is to know about what's happening with NFC and where it's going. Not to mention the controversy involved in um, how well it's going to work and is it a right fit. And, um, and things of that nature. So let's talk about then the security challenges. There are seven commonly known threats for NFC security, okay? Eavesdropping. Um, this is where a third party receives a signal using the antenna. Now, it's gonna be a little tricky with NFC, but I mean, it's not impossible. But at an, at an inch and a half or four centimeters, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Unwanted activation, this is where someone similar is somewhat similar to eavesdropping. Third party attacker tries to attack to activate the card without the owner's knowledge. So you, that's clearly something you want to think through and prevent. Data corruption or modifying the data. This is a modifying the data which was transmitted using NFC device using the valid frequency. It's probably a little harder to do that, but that's possible. Data modification where the attacker is sending valid but altered data to the receiving NFC device. So you have to be aware of that. Data insertion is where an attacker tries to insert a new message into an NFC communication. Man in the middle attack. 
have to be a pretty small man to fit in between four centimeters. Where two parties who want to establish communication are tricked into communicating with the the third party, which is therefore enabled to record the entire conversation. Possible. It needs to be aware of it. Denial of service. This is where the attacker tries to interfere with the RF field. And uh, that's one we're all probably familiar with these days in order to prevent the transaction. The point here is you need to research these threats to see how they might be used to compromise an NFC-enabled smartphone and the app. And that's part of what Endeavor, of course, would, would be working closely with, depending on the nature of your app. You may not need to do all these, but you need to know that all of them need to be discussed. All right? Given that, let's take a look forward into the future of NFC. Where are things going? From a hardware point of view, let's take a quick summary of what the prediction is for NFC-equipped phones. So as you can see, starting on the left, in a couple of years, they expect to have over 75 million phones. And let's face it, if Apple moves into this area and brings with it all the bravado and marketing that it does next year, sometime next year, let's say they do, there's a chance that this could really pick up and be crazy by 2013. So we have about one in five phones sold worldwide. By 2014, they expect NFC transactions alone will approach $50 billion. And then in 2015, the value of all mobile money transactions is expected to, to hit $670 billion. That, that's really a lot. A couple of um, other comments. PayPal seems to agree with this prediction. Um, they're just a giant in mobile payments, as you know, and they boldly predict that the wallet will be dead by 2015. PayPal, that's what they predict. And they're putting their money where their mouth is. They've recently acquired a mobile payments provider called Zong for $240 million. Google launched the Google Wallet. We've talked about that. Visa recently made a strategic investment in Square, with that little thing that fits on the top of a phone. And it's now worth more than $1.4 billion. Mobile payment transactions already total over $240 billion annually. So that's a quote from Juniper Research report, and they expect it to grow 2x and 3x in the next five years. So the race is on for mobile technology companies to get their devices to the market. But who will be the, do who will be the dominant provider in the mobile payment space? Well, that might be one of you guys that are listening in on the webinar right now. All right. With regards to the future perspectives and the technical perspective, there are some new standards being put in place to embed NFC chips into SD and micro SD cards, which is pretty cool if you think about it. Um, new types of NFC tags, which can store more data, that'll be really exciting for both marketing as well as retailing purposes. NFC enabled SIMs, for that uh, should be quite interesting, and SIM-based NFC payment solutions. I mean, it's entirely possible that you could have a little USB thumb drive with an NFC enabled SIM capability built into that. We'll just have to see. Um, so that pretty much covers the um, technology perspectives. I, I do have one other comment I think that's worth interesting. You know, deploying a universal mobile payment system might have a lot to do with the SIM card uh, as opposed to other kinds of new cards that reside inside our phones. It might be a better way to go about doing this as it turns out, the, the GSMA announced today that 45 of the world's largest wireless carriers are in favor of a SIM-based NFC solution, okay? And they've committed to support and implement related products and services. So SD cards are going mobile, and um, we'll see how that plays out in the mobile payments area. And finally, what's next? Well, it's just kind of a rehash of things that we've talked, but worth mentioning we expect there'll be many, many real-life scenarios that can adopt NFC, not just mobile payments, but, um, you know, just a variety of things that have to do with from when you're in your house to when you leave, when you travel, when you come back, you could potentially be using your NFC-enabled phones everywhere you go. So with payments, loyalty cards, couponing, information gathering, asset management, and more, these are all the kinds of apps 
app areas that people think that there's going to be an opportunity for business value. So thank you for listening to this webinar. It's packed with information, and I hope you have some idea of what's going on now in this area. And I hope you've been sending in lots of questions because now I'm going to hand it over to the Endeavor tech team, and they're going to talk about the questions that you have submitted. Thank you, Endeavor. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I mean, it was a good session. And uh, before we get into the answering the questions, uh, we would like to give some glimpse of what uh, Endeavor is doing on NFC. Uh, we have been in uh, NFC movement for quite some time, and we have been developing certain applications uh, which will be useful for transferring business cards, you know, sharing the you know um, text files as well as you know for the URL. So I mean, before uh, we end up this you know webinar, so we will be publishing some demo app that we have you know uh, published for this webinar along with the webinar content. Soon you will be getting it um, as our you know. Media partner will be providing this detail. So I'm going to give uh, the you know the answers for some of the questions which we got. Uh, the first question would be like who will be driving the NFC ecosystem. So uh, in this case, I mean uh, uh, when you see the end users, it will be NFC advertisers, retailers, and consumers. So when you go with that direction, right? Uh, you know, uh, so these are the end users where we will be utilizing NFC much more. Uh, but if you take it as the larger aspects, so then um, there are now stakeholders like M MNOs and uh, certain you know uh, bank uh, bank holders where they have to they have to you know install the infrastructure on that uh, to make sure that it will be available for the users. Okay. Next question is about like uh, whether the NFC will overtake with uh, RFID and Bluetooth. So. It is not like uh, NFC will overtake or uh, overtake uh, RFID or Bluetooth technology. It is like uh, just uh, like supporting technology for NFC and uh, RFID and Bluetooth. So like using NFC, you can enable the Bluetooth the Bluetooth carriage. So you can share the files using Bluetooth so faster. So like you can use NFC to get the Bluetooth uh, Bluetooth setup, and then uh, you can use like uh, uh, send the files on uh, on the Bluetooth channel. Right, so we have a, one of the interesting question is like uh, four challenges that uh, NFC faced in 2012. So uh, as of now, I mean, uh, though, though the Google uh, is providing uh, some kind of application along with, you know, partnered with some of the MNOs and so on, but uh, it has not come to that level where uh, people started using and so on. So the, though the infrastructure has been put in some of the countries and so on, but uh, there are lack of uh, you know clarity to the customers that whether they have to use uh, this application, whether it is secure, whether we'll be able to you know or transfer certain you know uh, payment mechanism and so on. So still the clarity is missing. So we have to uh, you know uh, the entire you know stakeholders who will be involved in this uh, to make sure that uh, 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 educate the customers and provide uh, some kind of a good applications for mobile pay payment aspects. Uh, one of the you know, questions that we got right now is uh, uh, how to uh, how to open uh, an NFC for mailing applications. You know NFC, as you know that NFC is you know proximity is very less, and once you tap it, uh, it has certain limited bandwidth uh, to transfer the data. So what we do is like uh, whenever you tap the uh, you know uh, another device, so the information will be shared. And after that, we have to use certain other channels like uh, the data communication channels like Bluetooth and so on to transfer uh, the data. But uh, NFC as such, it does not have that much bandwidth to transfer much data as of now. So next question is regarding iPhone, whether iPhone supports NFC or not. So basically, like uh, iPhone doesn't support uh, NFC natively, but there are some accessories uh, available which is like a iCard, so you can use iCard. So using iCard, you can add the NFC support to your iPhone 4S or iPhone 3 also. So uh, in fact, uh, Visa has already uh, started uh, started with uh, uh, started one pilot project in Poland. So which is like uh, they are uh, working with uh, BRE Bank. So they are like they are launching uh, they are launched uh, their own wallet system. So we can make uh, iPhone as NFC enabled. 
Um, another question is, uh, what is the future of NFC in emerging markets like Indian market? I mean, uh, as you know that uh, you know, in India, uh, Citibank, uh, who has been partnered with some of uh, the MNOs like Vodafone and so on, uh, they have already implemented uh, certain you know retailers to join hands with uh, providing some mobile payment solution using NFC. And, and it's been in the pilot phase right now. Uh, uh, still, uh, the enough information has not been provided uh, to the uh, to the you know customers or the market providers uh, saying that like, whether it has been successful and how long it has been achieved and so. So still, we have to wait and watch. Uh, there is one more question which we got is uh, how much data and what speed can be sent? Uh, you know. Uh, to, uh, from the you know um, NFC. So basically, I mean NFC, as you know, that it works with uh, 13.5 six frequency, which is merely similar to RFID. But if you take the data transfer, it ranges from you know uh, 106 kilobytes to you know uh, 424 kilobytes. So there are different tags where forum is identifying which can transmit much more. But right now, uh, whatever tag types that they have, it can support only uh, till you know 424 bytes. Um, there is a question like uh, how to store information on mobile devices. I mean, um, this is, uh, I think this question is pointing towards the NFC. So, what I feel is like, you know, uh, they have, you know, NFC has certain a set of APIs which has been provided where we have to identify which device supports, whether it is a writer, reader, what kind of, you know, type that we have to choose. So, based on that, we, it, uh, it will move. So, it can be a reader application or it can be a writer application. So. Uh, there are certain APIs where we'll be utilizing for that to write into the tag. So next question is about like whether uh, NFC is secure or not when like uh, if I'm using like NFC based phone and I'm keeping phone in my pocket, whether someone can uh, uh, like uh, whether someone can pick up the data from my mobile phone or not. So basically like NFC antenna will not work unless and until your screen is on. So if your uh, like mobile screen is off, so you're not able to transfer any data from your mobile device. So this way, like uh, no one can uh, read the data from your uh, NFC enabled mobile device. Okay. Uh, another one was uh, is NFC is really a technology in future? I mean, uh, basically, if you say that uh, it is, you know, it is under progress where uh, it is a communication, you know, mechanism where we can uh, transfer. Certain uh, set of you know uh, data to the uh, to the proximity uh, sensors. So if you take in that way, uh, I mean we have you know um, there are certain applications which is already available. But uh, we would say that uh, in 2012, I mean definitely uh, the uh, all the stakeholders will get together and make sure that uh, it will be you know faster to achieve as faster like Bluetooth and so. On. Okay, next question is about like whether current infrastructure will work for NFC or not. So uh, like uh, currently some merchants have RFID based uh, uh, card readers. So basically like uh, NFC specs are uh, compatible with RFID specs. So you can use like RFID reader can uh, read the NFC tag and the same reader can work for NFC technology. So in fact like uh, NFC reader can uh, read the MyFair and uh, Kelly card card. Okay, I mean, um, based on the questions, whatever we got, I mean, we have uh, most of them we would like to answer, but uh, due to time and uh, the permission, so we would like to uh, give it to Nidhi. Thank you, Dwarak and Basar, for answering the questions. I would like to extend special thanks to Sadeep Rao for sharing his thoughts with us. And I would like to thank Tom for enlightening us with such an informative session on NFT. I would like to thank all the attendees for your time and attention. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. We were not able to answer all your questions, but we will be responding to you via email with detailed answers. Please feel to reach out to us at info at techendeavor.com for any more details. Also, there was a question uh, whether the session will be available. Yes, this will be, uh, this has been recorded and will be made available within 24 hours at techendeavor.com backslash events underscore and underscore webinar. And also we'll be emailing the link to you uh, at your registered email ID.
And uh, just for your information, we'll also have uh, a white labeled application uh, available on NFC uh, to showcase uh, how basically demo the NFC in action. Thank you for your presence.